One of the most violent attacks in American history and also one of the least talked about. In the spring of 1921, an angry white mob descended upon a thriving community in Tulsa known as Black Wall Street, killing as many as 300 black Americans and burning more than 35 city blocks. Bodies of the victims were never recovered until now. 100 years later, a dozen wooden coffins have been discovered in an unmarked grave. ABC News senior national correspondent Steve Osinsami takes a deep dive at the search for answers in a new documentary special. Take a look. Do you remember when she told you or told you and other, other members of your family? Well, absolutely. Actually, I was um, working in Los Angeles. And I was in, at my desk, and uh, the phone rings, and it's the front desk, and they say, well, Joy, do you know an L. Doris And I'm like, what? What about it? What you know about my grandma? You right. know, I'm about, Panicked. I'm about to get mad. Right, <laughs> right. And I went out to the front desk, and there she is on the front page of the Los Angeles Times ah. with the caption of City's Very Shame. And, there, and there's my grandmother. That was the first you heard about this? Of the, of the complete story, yes. ABC News senior national correspondent Steve Osinsami is here with me now with more on this. Steve, thanks for being here and for all your reporting on this. The, the Tulsa massacre, it's one of the most violent attacks in American history, but also one of the least talked about. What struck you most as you set out on this search for answers? I think that's 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 the the big thing that struck me. It was not really talked about. And I will say that, you know, I am super proud to be part of the team that is telling this story because we are essentially shining a light on a bit of history that, as I write in the documentary, was lost in the uh, fo fog of aging memories. You know, this was a story that wasn't talked about by the black families who it happened to or the descendants of the white families who perpetrated this crime on this black neighborhood about 100 years ago to the day. And for very different reasons. Uh, one group was either afraid or didn't hear the story, afraid of, 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 afraid of what would happen if they actually shared the story. The other group was embarrassed by, by, by what happened. And so, you know, we talk a lot, Diane, about, you know, this racial reckoning that we uh, hope is happening in this country. And it doesn't begin to happen until we sort of speak the truth to events like this one. And, you know, and I, I also want to point out something we mentioned in this documentary. Um, the way that this sort of became known is interesting. It, it, it happened in the 90s after the bombing of the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. There were lawmakers at the time who wanted to say that that was the greatest act of domestic terrorism in Oklahoma. And there was a black lawmaker who stood up and said, while this was tragic, you know, what happened in Greenwood, what happened to Black Wall Street was a greater tragedy. More people were killed. There was a loss of generational wealth. You know, there was a neighborhood of hundreds of families, of black families, that was succeeding, where people had um, uh, true success and wealth, and that was taken away in this violent incident that so many Americans are just really learning about now, Diane. To think that it took the Oklahoma City bombing for it to come to the national attention in that way. And Steve, I know this morning the Judiciary Subcommittee is having a hearing with descendants of survivors of the Tulsa massacre. Viola Fletcher, the oldest living survivor, spoke on Capitol Hill just moments ago. I want to play a clip of that for you. My name is Viola Ford Fletcher. I'm a survivor of the Tulsa race massacre. Two weeks ago, I celebrated my 107th birthday. I still see black men seeing being shot, black bodies lying in the street, I still smell smoke and see fire. I still see black businesses being burned. I still hear airplanes flying overhead. I hear the screams. I have lived through the massacre every day. Our country may forget this history, but I cannot. I will not, and other survivors do not. Powerful words there from Viola Fletcher, survivor of the Tulsa massacre. Steve, I know you've talked to some of these survivors or descendants of survivors. How significant is it for them to finally be sharing their stories at this level a hundred years later? 
hugely significant. You know, th that just really moved me. She is 107 years old and still remembers what happened as if it happened yesterday. And that's what we have heard from the different survivors and from their families who've heard these stories. You know, being able to, to tell this story now is hugely significant uh, to these black families who feel like the world has forgotten what happened to Greenwood. And, you know, there, there was um, a, a woman who we interview in the documentary, she is the granddaughter of one of the survivors and we played a clip from her just a second ago. Her name's Joy McCondachy. And, and, and she told me that, you know, when, when, when all of these people like myself come to town, come to Tulsa, you know, come and sort of, you know, take part in the telling of the history, that she hopes that, that when we leave and when we tell the story to America, that we tell it right. She kept telling me, make sure that, Steve, you tell it right. And, and, and that's really one of the goals that, that, that I and the team that worked on this have in this documentary, was making sure that we tell this story right. Because, you know, for the first time, people are hearing about the bombs that were thrown down uh, on this black neighborhood, the destruction that happened, the generational wealth that was lost. And, Diane, one very important point, the missing. This is also still a murder investigation. Up to 300 people walked out of their homes and never came back. Their bodies never recovered. There were no funerals. For a long time in Tulsa, Oklahoma, there were rumors of these mass graves. And what you ended up seeing happening is that in the black community, those rumors persisted. No one knew for sure, but they were rumors. And what you heard in the rest of the city is that, oh, there's no way that can be true. Those rumors were confirmed with the discovery of these bodies. Not only did they find 12 coffins, but they also, according to the scientists who were conducting the dig, found what looked like stair steps in the mass grave that allowed you to get down to other graves. They're still continuing their search. In the next week or two, there's another dig. We plan to follow that uh, to see what they find. But I got to tell you, when they found those bodies, it confirmed a lot of suspicions uh, that many people had across Tulsa and really began sort of telling the truth about what happened in Tulsa. This documentary, of course, is called Tulsa's Buried Truth. And the truth was found when they found those bodies and, and people are now only beginning to discuss it. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful moment of reckoning for the city of Tulsa. Um, in the documentary, we hear a lot from the mayor of Tulsa. His name is G.T. Bynum. He is a white mayor whose family um, is one of the original, uh, original um, uh, families to live in Tulsa. He talks about how even though one of his grandparents or father was head of the Tulsa Historical Society, that he never knew about the massacre until he was an adult and one of his relatives was running for mayor. That he had gotten through most of his life without knowing that this atrocity truly happened. This is someone who should know. And what's happening now is that people are hearing the story, learning the story, and there is a reconciliation that's, that's happening. And some of it is searching for the dead. And also, there's, there's a big conversation that we also touch on about a very delicate issue, and that is the issue of reparations. Should these families whose loved ones were killed, whose property was taken and lost, who never got a single penny from insurance companies, should these families be compensated for their loss? And, and, and that's an issue that the city of Tulsa and its residents and the state of Oklahoma are struggling with today. Diane. And Steve, I know you also talked to singer Charlie Wilson. He's one of the most famous voices to come out of Tulsa. Let's hear a little bit of that conversation. Singer Charlie Wilson is one of Tulsa's most famous sons, and today he's talking about it. He's the lead singer of the Gap Band, who sold millions of records and named themselves after Greenwood. The initials GAP stand for the streets of Greenwood, Archer, and Pine that lead into the neighborhood. We decided to take on that name because we knew we was going to go all over the world, at least I did. <laughs> I knew we was going to go all over the world and it would have, we'd have to talk about that. When the band was touring in the 1980s, he says they tried to share the story of the massacre while they were promoting their albums. Well, people were just kind of looking at us like, are you sure? I've never heard this story before. So, I mean, you know, even that we told a story 
a lot of times. Nobody really responded to it because they just never heard of the story because it was forbidden to talk about. So, so Steve, explain a little bit, why was it so important to Charlie Wilson to spread this story, to get this message out there? And what's being done now to ensure that schools, for example, are now telling this story in history classes? So Charlie Wilson, who is the lead singer of the Gap Band, was born and raised in Tulsa. Uh, they named their band after the uh, streets that, that border into the neighborhood, Greenwood, Archer, and Pine. Um, Charlie Wilson has been wanting to tell the story that he shared with us for a very long time. And he tells the story of someone very close to him, a woman from his childhood who survived the massacre, who shared details of what happened to her and begged him because she was so afraid of what could happen to her if the truth if her story was told she begged him not to tell the story until she died she died a few years ago he is now telling her story he shares it with us we share it with you in terms of, of, of education you know there is a movement now to try and share the story of the massacre um, in public education in particular in Oklahoma but it's running into um, some roadblocks um, there is a bit of concern from the governor of Oklahoma that uh, the school curriculum shouldn't be sharing um, history lessons that make a significant population feel guilty for that history. And so there is a there's a fight ongoing about how best to share the story of the, the, the massacre, the Tulsa massacre from 1921 in public schools in the state of Oklahoma. A lot of people, of course, who feel that the story needs to be told plainly and honestly. So, you know, I will say, though, that despite that fight, there is a movement now as we are talking about reconciliation in America, of understanding what happened and sharing the stories. Hollywood is now sharing the story of the Tulsa race massacre in the series Watchmen Lovecraft Country. Um, our uh, documentary special here, of course, there are a number of other efforts too that are trying to tell the story. Essentially, the word is getting out and people are understanding and learning what happened. And for many, it's the first time. Diane. And Steve, after all of your reporting on this, what do you hope viewers take away from this documentary special? I want viewers to know that it's not over, that there are families who are still struggling with the loss of their loved ones. There is something about having a loved one taken away from your family violently and having this mystery that lasts for so long that is really tough on a family and very difficult. Uh, they're building a new history center um, in Tulsa to celebrate uh, the survivors and to honor the legacy of the, of, the, of the people who were killed. I think that's important. But I think that uh, the, the biggest takeaway, I think, is that, you know, and I'm gonna paraphrase the mayor of Tulsa um, who essentially said that a, a government or society, when it's dealing with an awful happening, can take a, a couple different approaches to how they reconcile that happening. One is to ignore it, to uh, rewrite the history, to, to bury it in the past. The other is to acknowledge it up front, speak the truth about it, and then begin the healing process of moving on. It is clear that the people of 1921 took the previous approach. And what's happening now is that the government of today, the people of today, the black and white families of today and black and white Americans across the country are deciding now's the time to speak the truth to these events and understand what truly happened so that we can learn from them and move past them. Diane. All right, Steve Osinsami, thanks for that and for your reporting on this. And you can watch Soul of a Nation, Tulsa's Buried Truth on Hulu right now. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.